Pirate Party, it's the Icelandic crew. I'm going to talk about them um, during my um, 7 minutes and 14 seconds. I also was co-founder of Talk Fracking. I, was, I am an occupier, very much an occupier, and there's a great surprise here today. Um, so I'm also going to talk about the importance of direct action, creative non-violent direct action. So, uh, the talks this morning were genius. I don't know if all of you were there listening to Netflix and Sam, everyone, it was, was mind-blowing. So I've cut out some of the better stuff I had because some people did it better than me. Um, okay, I'm going to start with a nice story. Climate camp, bloody amazing, climate camp. We had on all our flyers a quote from Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller said, to the post system, create an alternative system that makes the first system obsolete. And a lot of this real leafy thing is going to be that, without a doubt. Um, I wanted to uh, bring that up first because it makes me sound like I'm very intelligent, but also it is what it's all about. Um, look at the mainstream, well, let's stop calling the mainstream media. I don't know if Donald there is here, but he's right. Let's call them what they are, which is the extremist far-right billionaires media, because that is what it is. Um, their weaknesses, uh, their constraints, in a way, you know, we know about all the open and stuff like that, doesn't that? Yeah, we, we, we've got to stick to what our advertisers want, you know, the editors and the owners, they've got all that control and stuff like that, you know, that is a kind of weakness, and of course, something like Private Eye has a really good time lampooning the complete hypocrisy um, of, the, of the mainstream media, something like Media Lens goes to town and sets them all on fire and they're brilliant, and if you don't follow Media Lens, I really recommend them. Um, something like the internationalists, of course, just come completely ignores the narrative that mainstream tells us we, we should be following, and they, they've been following their own global narrative for a really long time. But, let's go further than that, okay? What, what they're really constrained by is the paradigm, their paradigm, and now is the time for us to actually start speaking from outside their paradigm. Remember about Mr. Fuller, start talking from the system that's going to make their system obsolete. It's a really good way of looking at it, see, not being inspiring. Um, We've got a great campus. Now that's really interesting. When I say we, I know that probably about half the people here are already working in the alternative media. Look at this. There was a room, three kids ago, something, the alternative media people. We we're in, in uh, Yulu, Mallet Street, and we're all being brought together to discuss how we are going to cover a huge student demo that's coming up. So we all went around the circle, and there was uh, um, Indie Media, there was New Internationalist, there was Distant Radio, there was Suki, a whole bunch of alternative media outlets, right? And then we ended, luckily we went this way around, we ended with Richard from um, Residence FM. Richard said, what are you doing? I thought we were alternative. You're all talking about covering it the same way the mainstream media does, put on a shoestring budget. Listen, this is alternative. It's a black palace. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. What the hell, give me an example, right? He said a week before there was this demonstration, a small demonstration in Holland Square, where the TSG surrounded them and gassed them. And that's very really unusual, and I never knew that uh, the gas had been uh, knocked out on accident, right? Anyway, he said our field recorder from Residence FM was there with the, uh, with the activists. And what he did was he got the mic, right? And he said, right, we're surrounded by TSG, they're now sending in the gas. Please listen. We put the mic down here, and he got out this book, 1920s surrealist poetry. And he started reading that. And the background sounds, people go, ah! ah Nationalist, nationalist, 
You're missing the point. There's a global problem, and we're going to, it's only going to be resolved with a global movement, a global media movement, and it's there already. Um, and be irreverent. So, point number two, speak from outside the paradigm. Okay? Let's look at the activist world. We're playing the streets, I'm 50, we're playing the streets, blew my head. If you told us at the time, are you bloody activists? We would have, are we? No, we would have shut down entire areas of London, and Liverpool, and Manchester, and Nottingham, and Bristol, shut it down entire areas, and turn them into parties, and reclaiming the streets, reclaiming the public space. It was genius, it was beautiful, it was joyous. There was only, there was only like 5,000 like 5, people turn up at Houston, okay? Some of you were there. 5,000 people turn up at Houston, there's only about 5 people know where the hell we're going, yeah? None of this, none of this, none of this, none of that Facebook, none of that Twitter, 5,000 people still turned up, killer stickers everywhere. And then we all disappeared to, what, like, what, a thousand go to Brixton, a thousand go to Shepherd's Bush, a thousand go up to Tottenham. Cops don't know where we're going. It's mar marvellous. Paradigm shifting stuff. Okay? And then let's move on, pop pickers. Let's move on to um, the G8 in Edinburgh. Okay? First time I've ever seen that stuff. Yeah? So we had um, the, the, the Eco Camp, the Sterling Camp. Yeah? It's, it's bloody huge. Great activists from around the world came there to try and shut down the G8. And we were organising for Barrio. Wow, I've only got a minute left. Man, that was like a good time. Um, can I two? Can I two? Yeah, okay. First time we see this kind of organising. It's really important, direct democracy, participate in democracy, no leaders, horizontalism. You know, that's great. That's paradigm breaking. Okay, then you've got UK Cut. Brilliant. What, what an amazing thing they do. The whole country knows that Starbucks don't pay their, don't pay their tax because of the bloody UK Cut. All right. Um, and there's more and more examples. Uh, Iceland, okay, let's fill out for the last minute. Right, it's really important what, what they're doing up there. Okay? So, so, you know, we're talking about hand on breaking stuff. Rather than kind of feeding into their narrative, ignore it. Create our own. We've now got the power to do that because of Tim Berners Lee. Okay? Um, Imi in, in Iceland. They're the same people who crowdsourced the Constitution. Famously in Iceland, when they had the economic collapse, they didn't bail out the banks, they banged up the bankers, and then they crowdsourced the bloody Constitution. This is fantastic. And now they're going forward with Imi, okay, which is a, a method of protecting. With the, uh, um, what they call whistleblowers, right? method of protecting whistleblowers, the same aim as the journalists. You know, these are the ways to do it. We are actually not sort of, we shouldn't be punching against them, you see? Go around them, go around them, which is where it's all at. That's why this is so important. That's why, you know, this is redolent with hope. Nafiz this morning, I'm finished now. Nafiz this morning, uh, Nafiz Ahmed, okay? He's, he's like, you know, great. You know, the Guardian sacked him. What a load of wankers, they're going to so regret it. But actually, it's great, now I respect him more for not being with them. But the fact is, his whole thing is right, you know, and he smashes the back dot. We're not in a crisis, you know, we're, we're the first people in the world to be living in a time of extreme climate change, extreme weather patterns, you know, uh, uh, infinite wars for the last resources. But we're the last generation that can do anything about it. That's the crisis. And it's not like, oh my god, we're fucked. No, we are going to be alive. We're going to be the people who are here that have finally risen up globally. It's a global movement. And we have risen up and we have just gone round the bastards. See it? Yeah? <laughs> so that's coming. Natasha, um, <laughs> uh, Natasha Fujio Wong from uh, Union Street Media Arts. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start by saying that it, it's it's great to be here and you know be in the room with so many inspiring people and and hear some fantastic <coughs> ideas um, and you know uh, just to share, uh, which which really is kind of the point of what I uh, what I want to share with you today is about more sharing. Um, and I just wanted to start by talking about a little bit about a documentary that I've been working on. Um, I've been researching uh, a documentary about my grandfather-in-law, um, Gianni Sundar Singh Segar. He was a political activist in the 60s and 70s, and he campaigned for the rights for Sikh people to wear their turban, keep their turbans on instead of crash helmets, and also campaigned for Sikh people to wear their turbans rather than um, uh, uh, conductors' caps um, for, for, for on the buses. And uh, one of the things that uh, has come up during the research is it's made me realize that not much has changed in, in, in the political system, in, in the media, and the way that they behave. 
from the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s to today, you know, those attitudes are still prevalent. You know, the, the, the bureaucracy is there, the structures are still there. But, but what has changed is us, our, our awareness, you know, our ability to take action, our confidence to take action, that's what's changing and I think that's, that's really something that we need to look at and realise the real power that we have inside us. So I want to talk to you uh, about the opportunities that, I, that I've seen um, that, to shift the energy on our planet and the role that the media and alternative media can play in this. And I want to talk about three things. So the strategies that I've used, what I can see that, that people are doing around me, and also the human experience as well. So my academic experience is in fine art politics and international development, and I left university feeling really confused actually about the world, and I didn't really you know, understand um, how I was meant to go out there and you know, go to Africa and India and help communities to, to grow. I didn't really feel equipped. I didn't feel like I had the skills and the knowledge and the tools to be able to do that. And you know, through my work, I've realized that experience, I think, is our greatest tool. Experience is our greatest asset and teacher. Um, and I've been drawn back into studying, actually, over the past three years. I've been drawn back to studying um, naturopathy, nutrition, Reiki, energy healing, um, coaching, mentoring. Um, and it's because the people that I work with in the communities and some of the most vulnerable, isolated communities here in Manchester and across the UK, I feel that in order to, to support these people to face the real challenges and the harsh realities of the world, I have to work holistically. I have to come at things from all angles. Um, and through my organization, Union Street Media Arts, which I co-founded six years ago with my husband, we've always been very aware and always felt, you know, what's going on out there. There were so many things going on in this, this city, so many amazing organizations and groups doing um, incredible things. But even with the largest number of creative agencies, PR agencies and production companies in Europe, we still didn't really hear very much about it. You know, we weren't hearing about these stories. We didn't see these people. We didn't see this incredible stuff that was going on. Um, you know, and on top of that, not feeling that the broadcast media was representing the views of ordinary people, wasn't telling the truth, wasn't educating people very well. Um, so our work is about supporting the growth of our planet through digital media. We, um, we, we have, um, uh, we run campaigns and we run social initiatives, we run training courses, we develop digital media content, uh, run PR and social issue based campaigns, and we also uh, develop and work on community development and participatory arts programs working with young people, BME women, um, very socially excluded children from Salford for example, um, working all over the UK and all over Manchester. Um, and we used to really focus on, on issues like race equality, social inequality, poverty, uh, discrimination, youth unemployment, racism. Um, and we realized that that was becoming problematic, you know, really compartment, compartmentalizing those issues actually in a way was kind of forcing us apart, you know, and keeping us working in our silos and competing for scarce resources. And um, we've now changed our focus because of this. And we work with organizations to address the issues and the ideas that underpin the collective issues that we face as a society. Issues like local economic growth, health and well-being, attitudes, our relationships with each other, with ourselves and other people, inner peace, you know, knowledge, love and compassion. And if we can start uh, you know, supporting groups and organizations and businesses, if we can be healthier, more confident, if we can find inner peace, if we can spread love and compassion, you, we, can, we can do all of this and we can solve all of our problems through creativity, through media and through action. We're seeing more and more organizations going this way. Um, you know, we're seeing a really major shift in the pattern of organizations that are taking action and, service, and, and, and undertaking service delivery and alongside that, raising awareness and doing campaigns to really kind of get their voice out there, utilizing new forms of media, alternative media to do that. Um, and what they're realizing is if, if change is to be sustainable, they have to 
do their service delivery, take action, but they also have to do this work alongside. They don't have to campaign, they have to get their voices out there. And, and many of these groups, you know, they, they aren't privy to these sorts of spaces. They're not aware of these spaces. They're not aware of, of where they can go and meet like-minded people. And so we spend a lot of our time kind of raising what their awareness around that. And, um, you know, th there's so many incredible groups here in Manchester, uh, incredible people doing some fantastic work. Really simple things, but utilising, um, you know, alternative forms of media and arts. And, and they're trying to bring the digital into class into the fold. They're trying to open up new spaces, from youth groups in Moss Side to, to women asylum seekers in the city. Uh, last year we worked with, with, with women asylum seekers together, supporting them to develop a campaign, um, to raise awareness about refugee asylum seeking women, about issues around deportation and immigration. Um, and we supported them to develop a campaign to take uh, roadshows into different parts of Manchester and connect directly with people in the community. They have uh, films, video installations, they have you know, all forms of creative arts performance just to, to, to connect directly with people um, and, and to, to support people to see that our issues are very common and relate to one another. So, um, you know, really inspiring stuff. And uh, my final point, uh, you know, I, I really feel that we've lost a sense of what, you know, the human existence experience is all about. We think of it in terms of the cradle to grave and the route from that, you know, one to the other. And we think that life is about growing up and facing physical and emotional abuse at school and settling a job that fits us into society and having a family shielding them from the ills of society and, and then working really hard to settle a pension that doesn't give you a great quality of life. Uh, but the human experience is so much more than that. It, it, you know, it, it really is. It's about growing and evolving our consciousness. It's about achieving a higher sense of purpose and understanding the true nature of the universe and our, and our place in it and our existence. And really, that's just the start. You know, we have enough resources to share and a whole possibility of different realities and different states that we are not even aware of. So, I, I will finish now, Drew. Um, you know, what do we do? Uh, I, I think, really, it's, it's about evolving our consciousness and supporting others to do so. And for many of us, we're doing that already. So, opening up more spaces and more platforms for people to be exposed to these new ideas, working at the grassroots, addressing issues that matter to people in the way that matters to them, you know, giving access to communities, to information, sharing our knowledge, sharing ideas. It's not easy. You know, when we go in there and we do this work, it's really difficult for people to understand how we are being manipulated by the media, by politics, by education. And often we can't provide the emotional support to people when they make these realizations, when they're going through these transitions. Um, you know, and everything we're doing now is training for the challenges that, we, that we're facing in the future. And I think this is a fantastic example of how we can support people, how we can spread this love and, and knowledge in the community. So um, I, I just want to say thank you and can, can continue spreading. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, we've got Angela Haggerty here from Common Space in uh, Scotland. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, ju just to point out, just before I start, um, I'm not actually the founder of Common Space. I'd love to take the credit for it, but I didn't found it. I'm just the editor. Um, I'm Angela Haggerty, editor of Common Space, which is a new media website that's just set. It's just five weeks old um, in Scotland, and actually, it's the brainchild of the Commonwealth Think Tank. The Commonweal was set up within the last couple of years and the idea was around the independence referendum um, was that they got together with academics, people that could create policy and they actually created real policy papers, things that you could implement in an independent Scotland. Um, it was non-party political, it comes from a left-wing perspective, but the idea was to create real tangible things that people would look at and explore and understand so that they would know that, it, what, that it, the independence debate wasn't just necessarily about ideas and theories of how things could be, but practical ideas and the things that could be implemented. Um, after the vote and the referendum, the peculiar thing, um, and I don't know how much knowledge anybody here has, so I'm, I'm going to speak to you as if you don't have any. The peculiar thing was that after the end of the vote, after the no vote, the support just exploded 
for parties like the SNP, for organisations like the Commonweal. I think the SNP's membership quadrupled. It went up to 90,000. It's one of the biggest political parties in the UK. I think it overtook the Lib Dems pretty quickly in terms of membership. The support just went crazy. That also brought in new student funding. So for the Commonweal, one of the things that it then created with that extra funding was a news service. And this came about because there had been a gap in the new media movement in Scotland for a straight rolling news service. There had been a lot of analysis and commentary, some really, really great stuff, but there wasn't straight news. So the Common Wheel decided to step in, set up the Common Space. They brought me in as editor. We are part of the Common Wheel, but we are editorially independent. So it's important to point out that we're not a sort of a, a kind of PR vehicle for the Common Wheel and its ideas and policies we are trying to establish ourselves as a, as a real credible uh, journalistic source. So just to give you an idea of what that new media movement in Scotland was all about, it came out of IndyRef. IndyRef was the catalyst for the new media. Um, but the, there's probably a, conception, a, a perception that the new media in Scotland is just an, a, a pro IndyRef, a pro independence media. That's not the case. It was the catalyst for change because it was such a big issue. It was one of the most important votes that people could take part in. And people didn't trust the media to give them two sides of the story. People didn't trust the media to present the alternative to people fairly. So the new media probably set up, it was within, it was before, a good few years before the NDO, I think, but it was only really in probably the year leading up to it that it really became something that was in the public consciousness. So websites that you might have heard of, Bella Caledonia, Wings Over Scotland, Newsnet Scotland, there was the National Collective, there was Independence Live, which was a broadcast service, there were individual blogs, there was a, just a, a massive amount of things just exploded on the scene. And they were really some fantastic work in terms of rebuttal of the mainstream media, so it was picking apart the things that the mainstream was putting out there that weren't necessarily true, that weren't representing the full story, so they would pick that apart. And then on the other side of that, they would just report alternative news, which then did have an influence on the mainstream coverage. So it was very, very effective. And you can see from the polling data and stuff that the support for independence, 45% of they lost, the, the, you know, the yes side lost the vote, but that was much higher than anybody had thought that it could ever be. And you have to credit the new media with a lot of that because they, they became the medium to inform people of the alternative. Now, social media was a huge part of that. Um, it was the, you know, it was, it was kind of like the new media coming in and utilising the tools that the mainstream media has, has sort of struggled more to get to grips with. The mainstream media has grudgingly got to grips with a lot of digital media because it's upset their funding model as well. They don't particularly like it, they do it because they have to now. But the new media has really come in and made something of that. So that, that was a huge part of how it was able to do that stuff. And it also speaks to people in a different way from the mainstream. It's very different. Logistically, it was all online. Um, the majority of it, apart from one particularly famous thing, the Wee Blue Book that Wings Over Scotland produced, that crowdfunded for, and produced the Wee Blue Book, which was a little, a, tiny, a, a very small blue book that was distributed throughout Scotland um, through volunteer networks, and that was uh, informed people of, of the kind of basic facts in a nutshell of independence. That was a very successful thing as well. All of this was possible through crowdfunding. Um, Hundreds of thousands of pounds were raised in that year preceding Indiref for these websites. Wings Over Scotland just re um, put on a, a re very recent fundraiser in the last couple of I think it was yesterday actually he put this on. Uh, the editor, um, Stuart Campbell, was trying to raise £45,000 and this is to fund, I think, a year's wage, some uh, new polls that you can do for the general election, that kind of stuff, a, a freelance budget. Tried to raise £45,000 and in one day, in less than a day, he'd raised £65,000. So there is a huge appetite out there for new media and people are willing to fund it. There is money there. Uh, the challenge, I think, for us is, is, find, is finding the best way to, to, to kind of craft a model around this stuff. So um, just to talk about, about Common Space, Common Space, again, we're trying to fill the gap for just a straight news service. One of the things that we've been able to do is employ a full team of journalists, full time team of journalists. None of the new media has been able to do that so far. Um, it's an incredible uh, achievement actually that the new media was able to do what it did when most people were doing it as a second job. They had full time jobs and they were doing this sort of stuff on the side. Uh, Common Space, we've got me as editor and I've got a team of three journalists. Um, we're five weeks old and in five weeks 
we've been covering some, we've, we've broken a string of explosive stories, we've managed to get some even into the mainstream, the Independent picked up a story that we did about Secret Hendy, Head of Transport for London, who was attending fancy male-only dinners that only had women there to wear tight dresses and entertain the men, and um, we kind of uncovered that, then even the Daily Mail picked that one up. My God, new media getting in the Daily Mail. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't know whether I'd be proud of that one. Um, so what we think that is very important in moving forward is that the, the new media in Scotland is not a one-trick pony. It was not just about the indie race. As I said, it was the catalyst for change. So the challenge for us moving forward is to expand what we do. So it's about, you know, how do we cover the general election? That's the next big thing for us. How do we move forward? And how do we get out of the echo chamber so that we're not just speaking to each other and like-minded people? How do we actually get out to people who, who aren't seeing our, our kinds of arguments? How do we get that message out to other people? Because those are, those are the, the minds that we need to present the alternative to, the people that are mostly kind of consumed by the mainstream media coverage. We need to find a better way of getting out to them. Part of that is professionalising what we do, I think. It's sort of giving some legitimacy to what we do. The problem is that people still think the mainstream holds the authority. It's very difficult for the new media to be seen as a credible authoritative source of information. And so the, the, one of the big things that we're trying to do is change that, and that is a real, real challenge for us. Um, so also moving forward is about not being, you know, the, the, there's a risk in the media in Scotland moving forward that it becomes very part of political. Everybody's all for the SNP right now, that kind of stuff. Um, we want to make sure that we don't go down that road, that we actually stick to the idea of doing independent journalism, and that we don't become too much about our political objectives or what we think, but actually just be straight about presenting the alternative, giving a voice to people who never usually get the voice. Instead of asking the same old people to comment when there's a story, ask different people to comment. Ask people that are, that are presenting a different idea for comment and get those different messages out that way. And hopefully if our coverage can get big enough, it's not just about being on our platform, but we can then take that to the mainstream outlets, which we've done a couple of times successfully, and they, pick up, they then pick up the story. Sometimes you'd be surprised at how open they'll be to picking up a story. Um, so the part of what we want to do is try and influence the mainstream coverage as well, rather than just be a platform for it ourselves. Um, it's also important to mention maybe that the National launched as well uh, after the new, the new media explosion. The, um, there was only one newspaper out of all of the national newspapers. There was one weekly newspaper, the Sunday Herald, that supported independence. All of the rest of them either um, didn't declare or they voted uh, or they were in favour of no. And so it was the Guardian, the Herald, the Scotsman, they all came out in favour of no. There was a severe imbalance, it's undeniable imbalance in the Scottish media around independence when only one weekly newspaper would come out in favour of it. Um, so that then, News Quest owns the Sunday Herald, which then launched The National, which is now a daily newspaper that was in favour of independence, so sort of trying to move into that market of pro-independence support. They know 45% of Scotland now wants to be independent. That's a huge market, but they're thinking commercially. They're, you know, they, I don't think of the national being you know, the same as new media in that sense because it's owned by NewsQuest, which while well, it's set up a, a brand new newspaper, it's not giving them enough money for staffing, it's not funding it properly, while well, they've set that up, they're cutting in other, the Herald and the Evening Times, which it also owns, they're still cutting editorial staff. So I think that the, me this, the problems with media structure still exist although the National has been a welcome addition to the alternative kind of media voices now that we're getting in Scotland. And that's a real testament to what the new media achieved in Scotland, is that it, it showed that there was a market for that kind of alternative <coughs> voice, so much so that you had a mainstream publisher come in and then set up a brand new daily newspaper. When was the last time that you heard of a daily newspaper being created? It doesn't happen anymore, but it did in Scotland, and that was a real testament to the new media stuff as well. So, moving forward, I think we've got a lot of challenges. The biggest one is funding. The Commonweal is funded by regular monthly donations. That's enough for us to um, employ 13 full-time members of staff. Four of them are at Common Space. Um, but these are not. These are very unstable models of funding, and I think the big challenge for the new media is finding something that, make, that allows us to plan for the long term instead of just getting by month to month. That's the big challenge for us. Um, but, you know, the, the, the mainstream has gone through its own challenges as well when it comes to funding. This is not a profitable business for them anymore. 
So while they're going through a transition that they don't really like, that they're cutting all the time, that it's, um, you know, their bludgeon are changing over to digital, from our perspective in the new media, we're actually, you know, this is a, a very exciting thing for us in new media. It's full of opportunity for us. And we are the more creative ones. We do more creative stuff with digital than you find that the mainstream players do. Um, and that's my experience of, maybe it's important to say, I should have said at the start, before I went to Common Space, I worked for the drama magazine for two years. I was the media and broadcast correspondent there. Um, and I worked for a while in London. And that job, um, for two years, basically, I, I studied the funding and commercial models of mainstream media publishers. And um, that job involved interviewing and speaking to CEOs and senior commercial people in those publishing companies. Um, and if you're terrified of, you know, if you think that it sounds horrifying, it really was horrifying <laughs> to get an insight into how they think, how they view people, what they're trying to do. You are a statistic. You are just a consumer of advertising. So that was a really, really helpful insight into how they think. And it's only sometimes by understanding how they think and how they approach things that you can then formulate effective ways to counter that. So I think, um, oh, sorry, I'm going on, Drew, I know I'm going on. Um, <laughs> For us, what we need to do, and this is really important, and why I'm really glad that I was asked to come down here today, is that we need to network more effectively. We need to be, we are going to get stronger if we're working together. We are not competing with each other commercially. We don't have this problem. We don't have to behave like mainstream publishers. We don't have to see each other as competition. And whether the new media wants to admit it or not, it probably does do a bit of that. You set something up, you want it to succeed. You want it to succeed more than you want other things to succeed because it's your thing, it's what you're involved in. But we will be much, much stronger if we are sharing resources as much as possible and constantly talking about how we can, and thinking practically about how we can change funding models for the new media. This is vitally important. And if we can strengthen what we are doing financially, Financially and think long term, we can. Scotland is a great example of what can be done. We could really do some incredible things and, and shape some of the, the mainstream coverage. speech after that, it's cool, That's, um, it's really inspiring, uh, there's a lot of hope. <clears throat> um, we're going to open it up to a couple of questions, but, um, and, but before people start leaving and, and uh, or thinking about the questions, I want to mention a couple of things, you know, firstly, pub, we're going to the pub after this, we're going back to the Student Union on Oxford Road, um, <laughs> yes, well done Manchester, um, <laughs> applauding the pub. Right, yeah, that's where we're heading. We're going to go, going to go and get some drinks. Uh, we're going to have a chat. We're going to join the people from the People's Assembly as well. There's other events going on in Manchester. Everyone's heading down to that place. You know, again, we've got to work together. Let's, let's hang out, let's chat, let's, you know, come up with some good ideas. Um, secondly, I know the temptation will be, when we pass the mic around, to do a shout out for your organisation or for something you're doing. Um, and that is obviously fair enough, and we, we love to advertise that. But instead, Send us um, an email with an advert, a press release, anything like that. We will promote it. We will support you. And instead, we'd like to open up this time for questions. Um, oh, and finally, thirdly and finally, we are running now a fundraiser that started yesterday to help fund our Anti-Daily Mail Week of Action. There's loads of free papers out there. There's loads of other bits and bobs. And eventually, that will lead into funding real media, hopefully, uh, create the fund that will support all media organisations. So if you can check that out and check out the website after this, uh, that'd be great. Even 50p a week or anything like that will be massive help if we all start working together. I think we can do it. Um, so, on that note, can we open up? Drew, you're going to take on the mic or something? Yeah. Uh, can I see some hands for any questions? And um, uh, if you can, direct them at someone. Okay. Right. We've got. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want? I'm going to take that mic. Yeah, you, you go with that. I know you can do it. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was about the earlier on one of the workshops we were talking about how like you can't really take advertising and I remember in the early days of Occupy when Occupy News set up and we talked at one stage but it didn't, didn't happen about um, the value of advertising but from ethical and good advertisers. Mm -hmm. See as a consumer of independent media I would be really happy if part of the job of independent media was to research the ethics behind the advert. So to me then I could get past that having to chase the label and see whether it was safe if the adverts in there 
ethic, like, match the ethics of the publication itself. And I can say, oh, safely, I know that's a good one. That was just a thought, I think. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, and we'll take you and then we'll come to the um, We talk about the media as biased and propagandist, but you also have to realise that you have to sometimes engage with what they're actually saying. There, there is some snippets out there and you have to be able to know what the feeling is like. You also have to give platforms to opinions that we may not totally agree with. So we have to sometimes converge with people who don't like an opinion. That's how the mainstream do. They get people right riled. They go into them. You know, they, uh, they don't say, oh, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed. It's not politically correct to voice that opinion. They give, they give everybody an opinion because, because otherwise the mainstream, the people who consume the tabloid press will say, oh, well, we wouldn't be allowed because these are all left-wing people in a way. They won't allow our voices to be heard because they will criticise us and say we're naughty children. So our voices won't be heard in this media platform. Thank you. Um, are there any final questions? We could take a third one and then um, we have one here in the middle of right, the green top. Uh, do will come to you with the mic. Oh, no. Uh, uh, sorry, I was going to go. I point you to this person here, now I'm going to feel bad, both of you. Go both of yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, so, yeah, both of you. Um, just a quick one. Um, are you noticing in Scotland, like after just this amazing um, independence campaign, that people are a lot more open to independent media now than they were beforehand when a lot more people probably thought the media didn't lie to them a lot? It's a continuation of the point the chat made up there, um, and it is a question. Um, as well, um, and the the mainstream media has, in effect, purged out a section of people who have no voice and cannot enter that conversation. So the usefulness of independent media is, is that it will include those voices, but the independent media is politically correct on a left wing basis, so they won't include those voices. So how do we get the independent media to include the breadth of voices that are not politically correct and allow the dialogue to take place because that's the point of diverse media and in fact what we're getting is we're getting two camps. Um, okay, so, so, so one of the things that are happening for uh, my example is going to be from, from the Muslim community, okay, is that there are not politically correct Muslims and they must not have a voice, they must not speak, they must not have any platform and I'm not talking about ISIS. Um, so what happens is, is all of these not politically correct Muslims um, okay, so for instance, somebody who believes in a united free Muslim world but also thinks that it's consistent with democracy. Now, a, the name of the united free Muslim world is a caliphate, and that is anti terror law. So they won't be able to a, explain that. B, it's kind of, you could even put it in Marcus Garvey's area if you knew who Marcus Garvey was. However, that voice will be out. Uh, there's many other forms of this divergent opinions, but because they're not allowed to speak, you actually don't get any of the nuances. So you won't, they won't be there. They're probably, if they're guys, they might be sexist, they might be, what you know, politically incorrect in other areas. Some of them used to be, before they were a threat to the world, Margaret Thatcher voters. So, that really politically incorrect. <coughs> Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's a really interesting discussion. And I think it's an absolutely huge one. The idea of trying to engage in that in any meaningful way in five minutes um, is 
probably ridiculous. It's probably, the, it's probably one of the major questions of our time, and it will be one that we will be struggling with, but we'll try and struggle with it openly. I want us to discuss how we talk about this by producing videos, by writing about this, by talking about it openly for people to um, engage with. Having said that, I'm, I'm going to pass over to Jamie, who's interested in coming back on the point about funding ad ad advertising, and then yourself on the point about Scotland and, and other bits, yeah? Um, yeah, just that, that one on uh, funding. Um, uh, ethical consumer, isn't it? Ethical consumer? Yeah, they're based in Manchester. So there's an organisation going on all the time that you can check it out, whether they're ethically sound or not. There's also an app, apparently, that's just come out. You can just like, brush it over any product and they'll tell you the whole history. So we're getting there, which is brilliant. But you internationalists have stuck to this the whole time. Um, and there ain't that many people who you can get funding from. If you're going to be really strict about it, you're going to end up with funding from a um, couple of hippie festivals and, uh, you know, ecotricity and stuff like that. It's quite limited. But this new media that's obviously growing in front of our eyes exponentially has the opportunity to underline that fact, underline how few, how few um, products and companies are actually at the extent, to put pressure on them. You know, the more that it rises, you know, uh, uh, earlier on today, um, Kerry, Kerry Amandela, script tonight, she was saying how many, how, how our, our media already can go um, viral. Well, companies are going to have to look at that, aren't they? You know? So it's a great way of putting pressure. And then the third way of dealing with this is also, you know, when they have, and now a word from our sponsors, you know, let's use humour. And now a word from the people who will never sponsor us because, you know, make a joke out of it. It's embarrassing that these guys, you know, they, you know like greenwashing bollocks, you know. And now a word from the BP who will never sponsor us because, you know. But, you know, it's, it's, at the moment, it's, it's difficult, but I think it's going to change because of this, this kind of new media development. Thank you. And for anyone who's offended by foul language, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. Uh, just to come back on the, the, the point about uh, media bias, um, and possibly, I don't know if there's any kind of crossover with what you were talking about as well, about different voices being heard. Um, there is a risk with new media because often the new media springs out of left-wing activism that it then just becomes a sort of left, a, a purely left-wing activist medium, um, which then doesn't really speak out to the people that you're trying to get to necessarily. So I think what the, the point is that, that it's very important that we make sure that we don't exclude the new media to only include voices that we tend to agree with. It can't be that way. The, the most effective way to defeat any argument is to is to confront the argument, is not to try and, and suppress the argument or shut the argument down or shut the voice out. Hear the voice, let the voice talk, and then then and analyse that. Then talk, then get more information, more comment, more explore it properly. So for common space, certainly one of the things I want to do. I, want, it's, I talked about it before. It's the idea of an echo chamber. There's the risk that you end up just speaking to each other and agreeing with each other all the time, particularly in social media. You retweet and you retweet and you like things and right on that nailed it, totally nailed it for you and the people that you agree with for your network, but not necessarily for everybody else. So in order to reach out and to get to those people, it's important to take new media outside of that sort of the, the left-wing activism that it, that it often sort of gets constricted by and, and make sure that you're getting out into all of those other arguments as well, particularly the ones, if you're going to talk about independent journalism and media, particularly the ones that you're uncomfortable with, because those are the ones that you're actually trying to defeat if that's what you're, you're setting out to do and presenting that alternative voice and idea. So, yeah, that's, for us anyway, common space, that's one thing we want to do. Yeah, and, um, yeah Natasha's actually up for taking that on as well. Yeah, um, I, I just kind of um, continuing from what Angela was saying, you know, about, uh, you know, we can't exclude those voices and we, we must confront them. And I think, um, you know, I, I spoke about compassion. I think that's really, really key. I think we need to be thinking about how we approach the, these people, these groups of people, these people that, that are very hidden in society and very hard to hear. Um, how can we bring their voice out and how can we transform their thinking, you know? And, and, and it is about compassion and working at the grassroots. It really gives us the opportunity to create safe spaces for those people to feel comfortable and to feel that they can, you know, they can share their opinion and that it's okay to think those things. Um, you know, and, and that they're not going to be judged, and, and that way we can have meaningful dialogue that's non-confrontational, that, that's constructive, and we can 
transform people's thinking. We can, you know, show show them alternative ways of thinking, and maybe we will change our thinking. Maybe we can become more empathetic. Maybe they will change their thinking. Maybe they will become more empathetic towards us. So I think the safe spaces are very, very important. People are on their own journey, and we have to respect that. You know, we we. All of us are on our own journey. People are at different stages of that journey, and we need to we need to to understand that that broader picture so that we can we can connect with people in a more compassionate way and and bring those ideas out. Right. Well, that is five o'clock on the dot. So um, that was accidentally <laughs> perfect. Uh, thank you for. Uh, reading my mind. Um, I, I'd like to make yeah, quite a couple of announcements or, or uh, sort of reiterate some, uh, some things and then I'd like to encourage us all to hang out in a, a place that's not quite as hot. Um, <laughs> I've, I've lost about half a pound. Um, so I really do want to encourage, uh, we do want to build a functioning, forward-thinking, independent media but we also want to start recognising that it, it you know, that in society, the things that we love and we want to see exist um, do require us supporting it. And that may, may be financially, it may be with your time, your energy, or, or sharing things. But hopefully, this isn't just a passive experience. This is something that we positively come out and away from and we actively engage in. And so, again, I, I'll reiterate, we've got papers outside, chuck them around. We've got weeks of action coming up, you know, anti-daily mail, Occupy. We've got um, real media. Um, launching and there's lots of other great things coming up as well and we will be advertising those things so please keep an eye on those things and you know please uh, engage us and please can you give a hand for our wonderful speakers I thought they were really really good